start? All right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Do we need to use the mic? Okay. Um, thank you very much. My name is Mawash Malik. Um, I am currently a legal counsel at Habib Bank Limited in Pakistan, and I used to be a legal associate at the Legal Vice Presidency here a few years ago. And I'm honored to be here with Ms. Haya Iman Zahid, who's the Secretary of the Committee for Welfare of Prisoners in Pakistan, and we're here to talk about the Prison Paralegal Program run in Sindh, Pakistan, by the Committee of, uh, for Welfare of Prisoners in Pakistan, and the government of Sindh, which is one of the provinces in the southern part of Pakistan as well. It's a joint uh, public-private partnership, and um, it's a very unique legal empowerment initiative between the government of Sindh, the state, as well as this Committee for Welfare of Prisoners. And before we start our discussion, we would like to show a six-minute video about the paralegal prison program, so, which defines and lays out the uh, problem and contextualizes the um, problems that the common person behind the bar faces and the difficulties that they face as they navigate the complex criminal justice system. So the video, please. कर सकते हैं गरीब आदमी हमारे को क्या दम है किसके आगे बोलने का हुकूमत के साथ कौन बोल सकता है At the moment, we're operating in four prisons in the province of Sindh. The Central Prison in Hyderabad, the Central Prison in Sakhar, Karachi Women's Prison, and the Central Prison in Karachi. What's unique about our program in Sindh is that we work with convicts. So we go in, we identify those convicts that are number one literate, they can read and write. And in addition, they have uh, a certain level of motivation. Whether that motivation comes from this, the need to, for redemption or salvation of the soul because they're serving long sentences, life imprisonment, etc. So we work with those convicts, we put them through an extensive training program, and then they're at the front lines, helping you know others in their ecosystem, in their community. <laughs> जी जिंदगी जो में पूछें तो आपने हमारा काफी बर्डन अपने शोल्डर्स पे लिया हुआ है जो चीजें हमें कानूनन उनको बतानी चाहिए उनको आप वो अपने तवस्स से बता रहे हैं और ये हमारी गवर्नमेंट की एक बड़ी अच्छी कामयाबी है कि उन्होंने आपके साथ मिलकर एक प्रोग्राम शुरू किया हुआ है कैदी को अपने बारे में अपने राइट्स के बारे में और उसके बाद ट्रायल के प्रोसेस के बारे में मालूमात का होना बहुत जरूरी है कैदी को जब तक ये चीजें इंफॉर्मेशन नहीं मिलती हैं तब तक वो खुद भी परेशान होता है हमें भी परेशान करता है मैंने फैसला किया कि मैं ऐसा कैदी बनूंगा जो मैं अपने दूसरे साथी कैदियों की मदद कर सकूं इस सिलसिले में जब मुझे पता चला कि जेल के अंदर एक लीगल ऑफिस रजिस्ट्रेशन कर रहा है कुछ कैदियों को ट्रेनिंग दे रहा है तो मैंने भी फैसला किया कि मैं इसका पार्ट बनूं तो मुझे फिर यहां पे लीगल ऑफिस ने के वक्त लगने ट्रेनिंग दी और मुझे कानून की कुछ बुनियादी मालूमात दी पहले मुझे नहीं पता था मैं बैरक में रहती जब मैंने लोगों को पढ़ते हुए देखा तो 
फिर मुझे हुआ कि मैं जहाँ पे मैंने जहाँ पे खुद नाम लिखवाया तो मुझे भी करने के लिए मैंने पॉलिटिकल साइंस में मास्टर तो किया था मैंने लेकिन वो मास पढ़ने में जो हम कानून पढ़ते हैं कि कवानी क्या है क्या वो और चीज होती है और ये कुछ और चीज थी उससे बिल्कुल ही अलग ट्रेनिंग बड़ी फैंटेस्टिक है फर्स्ट टाइम मैंने कोई एक प्रॉपर ऑर्गेनाइज ट्रेनिंग जो हमें यूनिवर्सिटी का माहौल था वो यहाँ मिला ये दस लेक्चर्स पे सेशंस पे कंप्लीट है मुश्तमिल ट्रेनिंग थी हर सेशन पे उन्होंने हमें बुनियादी हकूक के बारे में बताया आयन के बारे में बताया पाकिस्तान पीनल कोड के बारे में ताजरात पाकिस्तान के बारे में क्रिमिनल पोस्टल कोड के बारे में खातन के हकूक बच्चों के हकूक और जेल का वाले इन सब के बारे में बताया Through this prison convict led paralegal program we have trained 106 master trainers who are all convicts and with the support of lawyers legal professionals who supervise the quality of the information that they give out these prison paralegals these convicts have provided legal information uh, to 1400 prisoners across the province dusre bhi keh diye hain to hum to ek dusre ke dard ko samajh sakte hain तो हमें तो उनको वैसी चीज़ें बतानी चाहिए ना जो मसाइल हम खुद फेस करके आए हैं हमें जो दरपेश होते हैं मसाइल वो आज उनको बताना अच्छा लगता है कैदियों को भी पता है और जेल इंतजामिया को भी पता है कि ये लीगल एड के साथ अटैच हैं तो इस हिसाब से वो उनको फैसिलिटी देते हैं कि हमारे पास आएँ या हमारे पास कोई लिख के भेजें कोई काम हो तो हम उनकी मदद कर सकते हैं Of course these paralegals are not doing the job of lawyers they will not provide legal advice they cannot but they're providing information and instead of saying that i will solve your problem for you they are giving you the prisoner enough information enough awareness so that you can rise up take charge of your situation uh, be more in control you can understand how broken systems can be worked and that's what they're doing हम इतना जान चुके हैं और हमें किस किस से मदद लेनी है किस के पास जाना है और किन से मशवरे करने चाहिए अभी ये सब हमें आगाही इन, इनकी तरफ से हम इनके बहुत शुक्रगुजार हैं मुझे बहुत खुशी भी हुई है और बहुत मैं मुतमिन भी हूँ कि आइंदा मुझे अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह किसी तरीके से किसी परेशान नहीं आएगी कानून हिसाब से मैं अपने लिए बल्कि अपने दूसरे कैदी भाइयों के लिए भी इनशाला अच्छे तरीके से काम कर सकता हूँ उनको हकूक दिलाने के लिए जो भी कुछ कर रहे हो हमारे फायदे के लिए कर रहे हो गरीब आदमी को मुखद का काम हो जाए तो और अच्छा हमारे गरीबों के लिए तो ये दिल को तसली मिल जाती है इनके कानून बता देते हैं बहुत जरूरी है जिंदगी में जालू बात होनी चाहिए इंसान को चाहे वो अनपढ़ और जाहिल हो या पढ़ा लिखा हो हर हर बंदे को होनी चाहिए मालूम आई अंडरस्टैंड दैट टू डेट दिव um 104 convicts have been trained who have provided f- further advice and training to approximately 2000 over 2000 prisoners uh what i'm sure everybody here would be interested in knowing is the impact that is it's had this program has had not only on the prisoners on personal level but on the institutional departmental level as well and if it has any policy impact as well Um I just like to begin by uh thanking the World Bank and the organizers for giving me an opportunity to be here at a very exciting time in DC with the midterm elections but of course um uh, to be at this amazing conference um and to sit on top of a cauldron of magic in the heart at the heart, you know at the headquarters of the World Bank and just to see the mechanism through which millions of lives are impacted on a daily basis um coming to pakistan and the project if i can i highlight the problem context at any given point in time our prison population over the last 10 years has fluctuated between 90 to 95000 prisoners across the country coming to the province of sindh where i come from we've been seeing that those figures lie between 18000 to 20000 and that's not a lot considering our population however the concerning thing is that 80% of those behind bars are not serving time for sentences uh, for crimes that they have been convicted for so they are under trial pre trial prisoners 
who are languishing behind bars simply because they are waiting for protracted trials to come to a conclusion, and in most cases for their good name to be vindicated and for them to go back out into society. We conducted a baseline survey to understand their situational analysis and um, we engaged over 1,100 male, female, juvenile prisoners and we found out something very startling which was that over 80% of prisoners could not identify a single human right, a single freedom guaranteed to them by the Constitution of Pakistan. And that's the very basic of your social charter, that's the very basic of your human awakening. And in this context, the Committee for the Welfare of Prisoners, which is, as Mavish said, a public-private partnership between the government, said that we need to realign and sort of change our paradigm needs to change away from traditional rule of law, supply-sided thinking towards a more uh, legal empowerment-based uh, approach in which you are activating the human agency of prisoners. And so if you're looking at just the, the trained convicts, as the video showed, uh, their social mobilization skills, their leadership skills, their communication skills, all have been harnessed and improved. They're being reformed eventually after serving 5, 10, 15 years when they go back into society. They're ready to play a positive role. In terms of the prisoners who are receiving legal information from them, they're no longer in the dark. They're understanding not just, not just substantive laws, but they're understanding the procedures through which you can make use of them. So they know the law, and they're in a good place to be able to use it more effectively for their benefit. Um, and then if we look at beyond the prison ecosystem, beyond the community of prisoners, how are they impacting this? What's the multiplier like? I'd like to, to cite a small example of one of our star um, trainers, Nyla Essen. She is serving life, uh, she's a female con uh, convict. She's serving a sentence of life. I won't go into details on what for. Her son was two years old when she was in prison. It has been 10 years she has not met him outside a prison setting where she can hold him and hug him and make human contact with him beyond, what, beyond the restraints that exist. She, through this program, has been able to empower her sister who was subject of a violent relationship with her husband. She was battered and abused. She passed on information to her to tell her, you have a right for delegated divorce. You can get custody of your male child, contrary to what perceptions are, because the welfare of the child is what the court looks at. And you can make him pay up maintenance for your son. So she empowered her to, to rid herself of those shackles, to move on to a better place to make the right decisions. and. I mean, I'll just add this really quickly. She's now settled in Saudi Arabia and the Riyadh, living in the Gulf, and she's married someone she fell in love with after. But Nyla's still in prison, but she's passed on that empowerment. So when these folks go back out into the community, I, I don't think they'll be change makers. I think they're going to be empowerment agents. And um, I think you asked about... Yeah. Um, the also, um, whether they're having the this program or these convicts have had any impact on the prison itself or the institution or the government yeah, of yeah. sin, any policy matters that well, have come about, or change that has come about as a result of this training program. And I know it's early days because this program itself is just a three year yeah. old program. Um, so the government's focus initially was the mandate of the committee was to connect poor, underprivileged prisoners implicated for the first time for petty offenses with a free lawyer because we don't have a public defender's office. But very soon we realized the demand will far exceed the meager supplies. You're not going to be able to give someone a lawyer in all instances. So that's when we move to activating and bringing up the justice seeker so that he or she can make better decisions. And at the end, the net result is what the government wants, which is expedited trials. Innocent folks moving out of the system far quicker than they're entering the system, right? Um, so we're, all, we're on the same page with the government, of course, um, and hats off to them for their support, um, which makes all of this possible. But um, so coming back to what the prog how the program helps with policy making, if you may, uh, you know, sometimes governments in developing countries struggle with data collection and making sure that everyday policy making is based on the latest trends, the latest data. 
Uh, you know, you're, you're not able to, because of funding challenges, you're not able to commission the right studies at the right time, or you're just looking at dated uh, evidence. So our paralegals have been able to collect data on a day-to-day -day basis, and they're documenting their work. They're documenting the folks that they're engaging with, the folks that they're connecting with, lawyer, to, with lawyers. And one example is our parole laws. So if you've served one third of your sentence in some cases, and you know you, 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 you've obtained the equivalent privileges for good behavior, a parole committee is supposed to review your situation and recommend you for an early release. That's the, the, the case in Pakistan and other countries as well. In our province, the parole committee, for some reason, had not met for the last two years. And the paralegals identified those that are entitled, that are up for review, and they collected that data at great speed because you know they have networks inside the prison. They collected data for prisoners that are so sick that they would not be able to commit the offense again for which they came in because our law provides that the government can release those guys. So in that way, they're activating mechanisms that might be a little rusty, or they could even, I think, in the future, activate dead laws and really help help us and, and you know bridge that data gap and make policy making more effective yeah that's quite phenomenal that people who weren't about who didn't know about the law in a very short period of time are bringing about such changes not only on personal level but on a provincial level at least and hopefully on national level in the future um one thing that we would like to know are the lessons learned for developing such sustainable partnerships with the government and how you, you know, with the state and how we've successfully scaled this program for one prison in Sin, in Karachi right now. And you've, I know you were in the female prison in Karachi and the other prisons without throughout the province of Sin as well. So. Um, the Committee for Welfare was notified in 2004, so our journey is about 14 years old. Um, it's been a struggle, <laughs> um, you know, uh, but I think uh, the, the main thing has been the authenticity of your voice and your purpose and your cause. When the committee was founded, uh, the government notified a retired judge, Justice Nasir Aslam Zahid, uh, former Chief Justice of the province, a judge of the Supreme Court, uh, to lead it. Um, he, he still continues to work uh, for the committee full time. And um, I think though our journey was 14 years old, having retired resources like that, um, you know, judges from the Supreme Court, etc., that brings a lot of, uh, that brings the right vision, the right expertise and knowledge and know how to start something. But in this journey of 14 years, we've tried to keep our voice authentic by collecting data ensuring that our proposals are based are, are always based on evidence um, and in addition not shying away from when we've done things wrong and when we want to change and I you know and ideate again and change the design process so for example if our focus initially was on connecting folks with a lawyer we realize that that's not going to work we need the justice seeker to also play an active role in expediting trials and coming halfway so to say so we were quick to go back to the government we weren't always funded by the government despite working under their umbrella so uh, in the last nine years i have experience of working with a lot of donor agencies but despite those LFAs and, and those mandates and those agendas, we always kept their government at the table with us during the design process, sort of asking them, keeping in the uh, keeping them in the loop and basing our work um, so that that matches the need of the government and the recipient at the end of the day. It hasn't been easy. It's very time consuming. There are so many transfers within the bureaucracy. Every time you think you're making strides ahead and, and you know the other person is finally seeing what you're trying to say and you're moving forward, there's a transfer, everything goes back to square one and you're like, oh my God. You're viewed with a certain skepticism when you walk in through the door with your pitches and your presentations and you're trying to change mindsets. You're trying to say that justice rights are tangible outcomes that you can see um, this is where you have to put the money uh, so it's very resource intensive in terms of constantly sitting with the government but there's no other way we need to, I mean we're talking prisons we're talking criminal trials we're talking about the justice system there is no other way than to walk hand in hand with the government and I think once again just the authenticity of your purpose 
and your voice and your proposals is 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 the best way forward and also talking a little bit about value for money concepts in between telling the government this is how much it's going to cost you to keep these people in prison you know that that helps the economic arguments um in addition uh, capitalizing on non financial incentives i think that's helped us sustain uh, with, with the sustainability and scalability so our convicts do not get paid why do they do it i mean they're bored they're looking for salvation but what they get for every 6 months of training is a 15 day remission in the sentence that they serve and that to a person who's deprived of freedom is far more than you know a stipend or a free meal or anything so 15 days for every 6 months of training that has done the magic i believe in addition to certification celebrations and truly you know celebrating their journey and the good work and and reminding them of 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 the human impact because they're they're in prison at the end of the day but showing them and sharing the impact of whatever they do and trying in your programming to show the government that okay you know we're trying to be good with the exchequer we're looking to maximize on non-financial incentives to keep this going so it has a life of its own all right um the human impact is phenomenal as well and i think that's had an impact on the partnership as you've been able to develop as well and since we're here at the world bank at this forum um how critical is it to engage with for in or donors and organizations like the world bank as they design development programs and how critical is it for them to engage with non-profit organizations like yourself as well as they develop their programs and integrate legal empowerment elements into the um funding um i think the mindset really has shifted when we're talking about a rights based framework uh and development sector and the nexus there away from traditional rule of law uh, perceptions and 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 access to justice discussions and dialogues that focus heavily on building the capacity of the state the supply actors we've realized that that on its own is not enough uh social change agents they have to be the folks that are being affected by what the problem is they 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 have to speak up and take charge of their own situations so um i think we the grassroots players and the, the other side the donor agencies etc have made have come to that realization sort of together i i think they're aligned if i may say so globally on on, on that point um So this is a t- tough one. Um I don't I don't identify myself as a development sector expert. I have studied law. I've been working in the prisons for 9 years. Um I view myself more as a legal empowerment person or or practitioner, but having worked with the uh, donor agencies uh, for a couple of years in a few project cycles, I can't say that what's what's sad is in some context is 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 seeing the divergence, the gap between what I call the doers you know my team in the prison uh myself out there and the reviewers and approvers uh sometimes there is a bit of a gap sometimes you can't help it there are constraints um but if we can be consciously uh sort of uh, do a little more every time we we notice that that gap widening i think that helps that helps why because um that helps because the donor agencies the contractors are the back end office of development okay <laughs> i'm trying to be uh, proper um and 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 you know honestly the grassroots people is your front office if i may say so so the back end has to do the problem shooting for the front end to make this work to improve the quality of what it is that we're doing every day in fragile contexts uh, in situations where sometimes your life is at threat um you know so in order to, to effectively troubleshoot you need to be able to know what the problem is so you need to and we i know this is this is very cliche but you need to be able to listen a little more carefully and by listening i mean actually listening to the needs assessments the legal problems that that people are talking about and not just listen with a view of ensuring that 
you know what the right language is to make your own agenda a little more acceptable, but truly listening. So when it comes to developing countries, a lot of us don't have a legal needs survey. Australia you know, has them, Canada does, the UK does, India I think is, is in the works of, 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 of finalizing theirs. So in Pakistan, we don't have a legal needs survey. Um, so if we're relying on you know, um, other studies with questionable sampling, sometimes a very limited sampling, we don't have such a nationwide survey to tell us where we should be layering on our pounds, our euros, our dollars in terms of justice outcomes. So what do you do? You, you need to go to the grassroots players. You need to ask them what their legal needs are with a wider definition of what a legal need is. And just be able to listen a little more attentively and make sure that that engagement, that, that means of communication is always open, is, all, is, is always open because it is only then that a lot of NGOs will be able to be, be more accountable to the recipients of their, uh, their interventions. I mean, we have to be accountable to our beneficiaries as well. So we need to make sure uh, that there is a meeting of the minds. And that's very important. And we need sometimes our structures, our processes to be streamlined to ensure that that is a priority, not an afterthought. Um, and I think uh, just that dialogue and that communication is very, very important. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I know time we've got only we only had a few minutes to discuss all of these issues as well, and we it's I've been told it's time to wrap up right now, and. Um, so I would like to begin by thanking the World Bank, the Legal Vice Presidency out here for giving us the opportunity to talk about this very unique partnership that we a public private partnership that we've had with the state as well as the Committee for Prisoners of Welfare, uh, Prisoners Welfare as well. Um, for her to taking the time for you to you know, discuss this out here as well. And I'd also like to thank Habib Bank who sponsored us to come out here as well. And um, if you have any questions, we're available to talk about this outside in the atrium as well. And then if you have any words as we close as well so please feel free um i just i i think we've we've noticed a lot in terms of just helping people know the law so that they can use it and we firmly believe that together anybody can change it as well and um i think we go by that mantra and uh it, it, it's, it's it's only been three or four years since we've been doing this program within our larger mandate of providing people with legal representation. But I, I have a feeling that the human impact that we're seeing is going to multiply. And we're working on reforming the law. The prison law in the province uh, dates back to 1894. We're a post-colonial country, but the province of Sindh is act being active in reforming and coming out with new legislation. And a lot of the ideas keep in mind our experience of what we've seen in the last 14 years, working so closely at the grassroots level with prisoners. Um, and so I, I think that it is a good place to be at, working hand in hand in a public-private partnership in this context. And it has been such a privilege to come and uh, share some of that with everyone over here. So happy to take the discussion forward after the session. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haya and Maush. Now please follow our guests to the MC atrium and the Meet the Expert area where you will have the opportunity to share any comments and ask questions you may have following the session. Following your interactions in the Meet the Expert area, please join us for lunch that will be served in the same location at the MC atrium.